Conversion is a reaction in which Christ becomes central. He becomes the life of our life, the love of our love. You don't love Jesus more than anything, everything put together. You don't know him. You can't be half-hearted in this thing. He's the being of our being. He's the joy of our joy. He's our Lord. When a man born of the Spirit, there's a birth of a, dom a new dominant affection. There is a change sometime in the belief, not necessarily, but that, that's not conversion. It's much more than that. There's a change in attitude, but much more than that. There's a change in the direction of your walk and your thinking, but much more than that. There's a change in your affection. There's a conversion of your love. This whole business is supreme and commanding. Christ is not a rival. He is unique. He's the whole show, he's no show. We've altered the understanding of what it means to know the Lord. We know him not merely as a teacher or as an example, but as Lord and therefore as Savior because he saves people by putting his rule at the center of your heart. Salvation is getting a different master. We're translated from the kingdom. The word kingdom in its basic meaning means rule. We're translated from the rule of darkness into the rule of God's dear Son. It's different as night and day. To be converted means to be head over heels in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Read again and again and again the Song of Solomon. The bride crying out pains of love and joy. Oh, where is he whom my soul doth love? My beloved is mine, and I'm here. That's what it means to know the Lord. And I want, in these days, this generation, to be confronted afresh with this one who on the cross bought the right to be the despot, the monarch, the totalitarian ruler of everything that rises and rages. The generation knows nothing of the Christ of the Bible. It seems pessimistic and sour grapes, but this is a statement I believe to be true, that what has passed for the gospel is the preaching of one six of the truth of Christ. Christ, I hope to speak on it tonight. I'm not certain. This generation, they, they think a lot of Christ, but they don't like his word, his office word. They don't like him on the job. And they think they can separate him from his mission and his job. But in, for instance, I like personally, John Kennedy. I thought he was a brilliant personality. I didn't like him as president. But you can't play that way because he was president. I've been told that Khrushchev was a lovable person. I get him about half drunk and he's the best fellow this side of him. And I expect I'd like him. I, 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 I like a drunkard better than I do a church member because a church member's tired and a drunkard ain't. And if there's anything on earth that smells bad, a 
with the five churchmen. I burned my hand one time when I was a boy plowing out here in West Texas, and I had to plow middle busters and one of these northerners, and, and they got that burn there, and then that flesh got proud. Boy, that's over. Almost as bad as a sanctimonious pious churchman. They're pain in the neck. I, I, I couldn't, I, I, you see, I, I say, well, I like Mr. Khrushchev. He's a nice fellow, jolly, you know, when he's drunk. But I didn't like him as the secretary of the Communist Party. But he was the secretary. And you can't separate Jesus Christ from his officers. And that's where the conflict is now. Thus far, we've preached one half of one-third of the office work of my Lord. He's prophet. You see, we've got a generation of people in our churches now that are saved, I tell you, but they don't pay a bit of attention to the teachings of the Lord. See? But he says, take my yoke upon me and learn of me. To be a Christian means to enter the school of Jesus Christ and let him teach. And every one of his teachings will kill you. The flesh can't take a single teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Especially religious flesh, which is the worst kind of flesh there is. <laughs> well, we haven't said anything about that in your damn mind, brother. Just get saved, you know, whatever that means. And the old Baptist priest says, get saved, be converted, be baptized, and be done. And that's what we've done. We got saved, we got baptized. Goodbye, Jesus. Glad to have met you. We'll see you in heaven if you happen to make it. But that won't work. Amen. And then he's priest. He's God's priest. And we have done a pretty good job preaching one half of his priestly word, that which he did on the cross. Bless it. But, of course, we don't need him now where he is now. As our high priest to take us by the hand and lead us in the wilderness journey. Not much said about his presence, priestly word. But you can't take Jesus, you can't take any of these offices away from you if you preach him. And then, of course, the nice to postpone the fact that he's God's king. And we said one day he's going to be king, Lord. But we'll not be worried too much about that. But he's not going to be. He already is. And if you want him, you'll have to take him as your teacher, as your priest, as your Lord. That's Christ. That's Christ. I want... I want I want to, I wish I knew how to preach him in all the glory of his person and his work. On the day of Pentecost, it was done. And would you turn to that chapter, chapter 2? <clears throat> there are four things about this revival, if we'll keep using that word, that took place on the day of Pentecost. I hope to mention two of them this morning, two perhaps tomorrow morning. I maintain that here we have a model. I believe that Pentecost can be repeated again and again and again in the same place that took place there in a local church. Before the morning service is out, I think I'm going to presume on your openness and your good heartedness to just give you a brief outline of what I have touched on yesterday when I said the church has been out of order. Some things that work if we were in order, it won't work now. We got out of order. 
they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We've, we've got way past the apostles' doctrine. We've improved on them, you know. But they just stayed with us. The apostles' doctrine is what the Lord taught the apostles, and they taught the people, and they just had to see the apostles that this is what Jesus said. First chapter of the book of Acts, the first verse says, I began to write to you, O Theopolis, of all the things that Jesus began both to do and teach. And I'm going to continue to talk about some of the things the Lord does. He always did first and then explained it. Explained it. Oh, my soul. He has a tremendous act of the Lord. And then he explained it. He did, and then he talked. You see. It's been reversed with us. We haven't had the doing, the demonstration, and we've been speaking in a vacuum. I won't see a return to that, and I believe we can. I believe a church that's at least one inch from hell can experience Pentecost. I believe it. Not some of the incidental. But what is Pentecost? It's Jesus Christ manifesting himself in and to a congregation of people. That's all it is. It's the living Christ. And we'll see tomorrow that he did it through preaching. And he can do it again. Through the preaching what Peter preached. Christ was pleased to reveal himself and at least 3,000 people found out who he was. Huh? Now we won't see that happen again and again. And I'd rather fail shooting at this than to succeed saying it can't be done. I am sick and tired of all of this pessimism of the hour. And we need to get us a new Bible or to begin to pay some attention to this one and say, Oh, God, do it again, do it again. On the day of Pentecost, when they heard this, verse 37, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, men and brethren, and to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That be revived. Now, how did that come to pass? Four things, I think, explain this chapter as to how the blessed Lord was pleased to reveal himself, confront men with himself. Get it again now. The only way you can get Christ is in the truth of him. I wonder if that's clear now. You don't get him through a vision. You don't get to him through a vision. You're going to have to come to him in the truth of him. And the truth of him is what has been hidden from this generation. How did, did he reveal himself here on the day of Pentecost? First, I mentioned in passing, he revealed himself according to his sovereign will. He just did it. Now all this fool talk about if we get everything just fixed up, well then the Lord would give us revival. Well, that's just not so. We cannot command his presence. There's no recipe. The Spirit blows where he will. Is that right? But I tell you, the thing keeps me going, and I trust it's true of you, is that if he takes notion to reveal himself, bless God, come hell or high water, he'll do it. Conditioned or no condition. <laughs> if 
He did here. Show me some some favorable atmosphere for him to come and make himself known tremendous power. Bless God in the political world and the religious world. There wasn't a breath of friendliness to encourage his revelation. He'd just been crucified by a combination of religion and politics and wisdom. Neither the Jew representing religion nor Rome representing politics was favorable to a revival. But he came. There's just a small band of perhaps 120 people and the whole rest of the world, religious and political, just been guilty of taking the Lord of glory and hanging in between two feet. Yet he came. Well, the religious world dead sure not favorable to the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ now. You just look about you, my God, there's no hope. The whole outfit preaching some kind of Jesus. I wonder if it isn't the same one that Paul warned of. Even in his day, he said, when they come to you preaching another Jesus, another gospel, in the power of another spirit, is that the Jesus? that has filled our churches full of carnal reprobates and rebels who dare to name him Jesus with their lips and deny his daily rule in their lives. This other Jesus. Surely if Paul needed to warn about the preaching of another Jesus, we need to take it seriously now. The religious world today is not friendly to Christ revealing himself if it would be. Listen to me. The preaching of the absolute sovereignty, lordship of King Jesus would not be so hated. That is the issue that got every church in Houston split wide open. I hope this one's accepted. That is the issue of the hour. Who is Jesus? A futile, defeated personality of the Lord of glory who holds the reins of your heart in his hand. To whom dominion and absolute authority, A.W.L., all of it has been given of the Lord. That's the last to stick with, to live by and die by, ladies and gentlemen. You better listen to me now. The churches are not in divine order. Hear me? And we've got to press toward one thing. If you people don't come under the authority of Jesus Christ in that local church where you say you worship, you're going to spread hell wide open. Let me repeat. Baptism in the New Testament. We're a million miles away from what it meant. On the day of Pentecost, it means what it must come to mean again. To be baptized is to come under willing subjection to the authoritative voice of the head of that local church through the voices he's ordained to speak for him. Amen. 
You say, well, I'll follow the Lord, but I'll not follow the deacons or the pastor and the elders. We're going to have to come back and get some of those elders that's in the New Testament, too. Men who have the rule over you. And the scriptures say you obey them. They watch for your soul. Somebody said, well, I'm going to follow the Lord, but I'm not going to follow Brother Jackson. Well, you're going to spread hell wide open too, honey. That's exactly what you're going to do because you cannot follow the Lord unless you follow his voice. And he speaks in the local church through those he set there with the voice of the Father. Now, is that clear? These spiritual outlaws are going to spread hell wide open. I'll follow no man. You will or you'll go to hell. You can't hear from God except you listen to his anointed voice. And he's the head of this local assembly. And if you want to be obedient to him, you'll be obedient to those who are set with the voice of authority in this local church. Now, that's where revival is going to start. It's going to start right there. What are you talking about? A church that does not bear the marks of the Lordship of Christ hasn't got any message for this rebellious generation. It just needs to join this generation on the morning's day. See? My theology is that the movement of the Spirit of God is the planting of some New Testament churches that are in willing subjection to the living Lord whose two places in the body is the right hand of God in the Spirit, he's right here as the head of the church. And he promises to grace that church with his presence if it meets in his name, under his authority, being obedient to him. And to say that can't be done, how you know? We haven't tried. But that's exactly what's going to have to take place. He reveals himself. But thank God if he's pleased to, he can do it. And that's my hope. In the second place, I've already anticipated, he revealed himself in great disturbing power to a local ascendant. You've heard the expression that every great revival is taking place in spite of the churches. That good preaching is just not so. Even a man like Whitfield and men like Wesley, Whitfield especially, when he came to America, when he hit a section of America where the churches were out of order and in rebellion, just going through the motions, he couldn't get to first base. Brother, we yet have never come to the Bible conception of the tremendous importance of the local assembly of God's people. Oh, that's something of the globe. My float out of One of the most humbling things I've ever seen and yet the most encouraging thing I've ever seen in the Scripture. You turn to it sometimes you want to, the 12th chapter, 1 Corinthians. By the time you get to there, not too long after Pentecost, something's happened. They're improving on the apostle doctrine. They don't need to pray anymore. They're just four things. Here's the only thing the church is supposed to be doing. Continue steadfast in the apostle doctrine and in fellowship. That means partnership. You've got no spectators, member of Greenwood Baptist Church. They're all in this thing, brother. We're fellows in, fellows in the same ship. One sinks, the other sinks. One hurts, the other hurts. One's happy, the other's happy. We're partners in this. God bless your heart. They continued. 
And then they continued in what prayer and in the breaking of bread. That way your discipline is. That, that, that's it, too. Yeah. You say, well, we can't get back to it. How you know? Till you try. Well, you say, can't be perfect. That's reason we need authority. See? You say, well, we'll never have a perfect church. Well, till you get perfect, you need to be in obedience to authority. Brother Tyner had to spank his boy last night. Not a big old giant spanking that little old boy. But it has to be done. Of course, when the boy gets mature, maybe get bigger than his daddy, that'll cease. But until... That happens, the boy must be under authority. And until you get perfect, you must be under authority. Eh? And if there are not voices in this local assembly that are set in this body to speak for Christ, then this is not a church. And if there are, you better listen to them. I have had 12-year-old girls listen to me preach and go out and say I didn't agree with the preacher. My God, if that ain't something now. Huh? Little flapper of panty. You see, it's the spirit of this age. Authority. Bless God, he revealed himself in disturbing power to a local church. That's where he's going to do it again, brother. That's the only place it's going to happen. It ain't going to be done down here on the street. It's going to happen right here. Somewhere. And then it'll spread out. This, is, I, I, I think I forgot what it's talking about. In the first Corinthians chapter 12, time we got over there, just name it. And everything can be thought of that could be wrong with the local assembly was wrong with that one. And yet in the 12th chapter in that mess, the Holy Spirit through Paul said, Ye are the body of Christ. Isn't that a challenge? I don't expect everything's right here, Brother Jackson. But the Holy Spirit comes and says, Brother Jackson, you and your people be challenged for this. Be greatly humbled by this. Oh, be set on fire by this. Out of order. Far from perfect. Children of tradition. But glory upon glory. Ye are the body of Christ. Oh, how dare you. That's something. The greatest privilege any human being could ever have would be to be one of the gang of people who are the people of God in any given generation. Ye are the body of Christ. Here's a little heresy. The book of Corinthians identifies Christ with his people. It says that the head and the body are O N E one. And you cannot be obedient to the head and be disconnected with the body. I've actually heard it preached all over this country. The fellow says, well, now, I tell you, Brother Barnes, I want to be saved, but I don't want to be baptized. Oh, well, now, Brother, brother, you, we're not talking about baptism. We just want to get you fully on that sort of stuff. There's no salvation in the New Testament apart from baptism. You better become a Camelite, honey. They got baptized. It is right in that thing. It is being identified with Christ as he spoke in that local expression. And there's no salvation 
apart from that. And I've heard him say, well, now, Brother Barn, I won't get converted, but I don't want to join. Oh, we're not talking about joining the church. That's their prayer. There is no salvation in the New Testament apart from being baptized in the one body by the Spirit. We were put by the Spirit of God into the body bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You see, we've been identifying salvation a million miles from obedience and authority, and it just won't work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are concerned to see revival of the revelation of this great sovereign Lord Jesus Christ in our time, be concerned to build local assemblies wherein he might be pleased to manifest his power to move upon the human heart. That's the call of this hour. And there are three things that the scriptures say are true of this local assembly in Jerusalem in which he was pleased to reveal himself. They must be true of us. First, they were of one accord doctrinally. They were all of one accord. What does that mean? It simply means that on the basic doctrine, they were together. Now, I've used up so much time playing around. I'll not go into that second chapter this morning to show you the scriptures that back that up. Uh, maybe we'll get to it tomorrow, but they're there. Now, I do not say that there must be basic accord on everything taught in the Bible, but I do say that on the day of Pentecost, every last one of them were together on two things, the cross and the throne. The cross and the throne. Just two things. In the sermon of Peter, you kill the Lord of glory. God set him on a throne. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you think you can build a church that will stand the test of time and will be a witness in this generation out of folks at least 1,700 different things about the cross of Christ and his exalted throne, you're wrong. These things are basic. You see what I'm talking about? You can differ on some other things, I guess. Being human. But this has got to be basic. To be a witness, it says in there, you're witnesses of these things. The man's more than observation of certain facts. The devil observe the cross and the resurrection book. I, the men in Jerusalem looked at Christ on the cross and at least uh, heard tell of his resurrection appearance. But only those who had some understanding of the significance of the cross and the resurrection could be true witness. You see, you can believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ as a doctrine and go to hell. See? The New Testament people, they didn't know nothing about the doctrine for a while, but they walked with the Christ. They had the experience and then wrote the doctrine. We try to get, take the doctrine and get back to experience. They knew the living Lord. You can be as sound as a dollar on your theory of the atonement and go to hell. The devil sound there. But to be a witness and experience the power. And God help us to major here. I left camp on it, but I'm going to finish. The second thing, of course, about this church, they were together on these two basic doctrines. If you get right here, 
if you don't get right here, you'll make a major out of a minor. This is it. What happened on the cross and what's happening right now on that throne. See, these must, we must be together here. And then this church was a church of prayer. Of course, you're familiar with it. They prayed. Mary, who all was it there? Verse 14, verse chapter 1. These all continued one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Prayer. When my time is up, then I'll just mention that one. The third thing that's true of this <coughs> local church it was a waiting church. In the first chapter, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, they commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait <coughs> for the promise of the Father. Now, what does waiting mean? Listen to me in the next two minutes. Waiting means two things, obedience and utter dependence. Waiting. Being obedient to all you find your hands to do. Walking in all the light you've got. And utter dependence on the moving of the Holy Spirit to make Christ real to men. You cannot have this waiting today in the average church because there's not the Spirit of the obedience is the spirit of rebellion and lawlessness. That lawlessness must be flushed out and crushed in faster by the power of God. The very mention of the absoluteness of the Lordship of Christ stirs up rebellion. And we do not have the sense of utter dependence upon the power of God when salvation is seen, when salvation is seen to be what it really is, a sweet kneeling before the throne of Christ. That's where he is, brother. And if you want to have contact with him, you've got to contact him where he is and he's on the throne. It's a sweet kneeling before him on the throne, rejoicing that God was sovereign in him absolutely. Now, if you believe that's what salvation is, you'd have some sense of feeling how utterly dependent we are on the power of the Holy Spirit. No man's going to bow to my Lord unless God Almighty operates on his own heart and will. I cannot get inside of you. Only the Spirit of God can do that. All our methods are as hopeless and helpless as they can be. We're utterly dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ being made real to men by the Holy Ghost. This must no longer be a matter of doctrine, creed, or lip service. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. Oh, my soul. Dependent. Dependent on the working of God. Our Father, we pray that the will of the Lord Jesus Christ might be made manifest to us right now in regard to anything that ought to take place in the next moment. Lord, crush people, bring them to kneel sweetly before you on the throne to carry with them a private mourner's beach until they're caught up to meet the Lord. Speak to hearts. Get inside of people. Tear up everything that detracts 
from the throne rights of King Jesus. We beg in his blessed name we're going to sing one verse of Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Somebody maybe ought to come asking for mercy. Somebody says, Lord, done something for me since last we met. You want to tell us about it? Somebody might want to come for public confession. Somebody might want to come for anything. I don't know how the Spirit moves. If he don't move, won't do any good anyhow. If he does, do what he tells you to do right now. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Give you an opportunity to move.